Hi, Georgia. Thank you so much for joining us for these awards tonight. It's so wonderful to have you with us um, and to have you in conversation. Um, let's start um, from the beginning. And can you tell us a little bit about what motivated you to become a lawyer? When did it all begin for you as a lawyer um, in the legal profession? Sure. Well, thank you very much for the invitation and I'm sorry I can't be with you in person and thank you for accommodating the, the video interview when I know you've had to start very early for me. Um, I grew up north of uh, Sydney by the beach and my dad uh, was the solicitor and actually he's just celebrated 50 years since his um, admission and still dabbles in the law. So I used to go in and out of his office quite a bit. Um, loved the environment there, loved hearing what they were talking about. Used to steal the biscuits from the, <laughs> uh, the cafe area in the office. And I think that was probably my first introduction to, to life as a lawyer. Uh, I still wasn't sure whether I wanted to be a lawyer. Um, so during school, I did some work experience and then spoke to the careers counsellor at school. Um, and she said, if you're not sure, then law's a great grounding for numerous different jobs, be that government um, becoming a, a lawyer, going into teaching, journalism, etc. And so I decided to, to do the law degree and did a range of different part-time jobs during university, researching in barristers' chambers, working in law firms, and uh, ultimately fell in love with the pro problem-solving aspects of it, which is why I then stuck with it and, and went into private practice. So obviously this year you made history by becoming the first um, woman um, to lead one of the global law firms, uh, Freshfield. Mm -hmm. And um, so, uh, you know, what do you count, apart from obviously this historic moment, I'm sure that will count towards your greatest achievements, but when you look back and reflect on your career to date, um, what, do you, what are you most proud of? Well, I've had a really varied and, and rich career, so that in and of itself I count as, a, um, as an achievement or it's certainly a privilege. Um, I've had some fantastic successes for clients on either investigations, mandates or, or um, litigation. Most of them are confidential, so um, I won't go into the detail for those, but there's nothing more satisfying than seeing a happy client. Just yesterday, actually, we had a decision in one of our pro bono cases in the region and to get the good result and see the effect that it's going to have on somebody's life is probably one of the best moments of being a lawyer, I think. Um, beyond that, I think that point around being able to work in so many different countries and um, having that rich and varied career has been a, a real highlight. So just in the, the past year alone, my cases have been <clears throat> in places such as uh, Papua New Guinea, Ghana, Kazakhstan, and then back to Asia in, in Indonesia. So to have the opportunity to learn about new cultures, new legal systems, meet great lawyers um, and help clients with their challenges around the world has, has been one of the things I've certainly enjoyed most. And then I think the other thing that I would have to add is the pleasure that comes with working with your teams, developing your teams and seeing people come on to thrive in their careers, be that on the legal side or the business services side, playing a role in mentoring and developing somebody else is probably one of the most rewarding parts of getting into a leadership position. So what do you think um, um, the profession can do to create a more equal playing field for women and for everybody that wants to succeed really? Um, regardless of where they start in life? As a, a firm, we're focused on a range of different things. and it's, We've structured it under three different headings to try and drive forward our diversity and inclusion agenda. And I think that is a good roadmap for the profession more, more generally, if I could be so bold as to suggest we, we can help frame some of the debate. But the, the three areas are um, around belonging. So a real focus on inclusion and creating a workplace that is attractive to both men and women. Um, and that probably requires a bit of a reshaping of our workplace and our workplace cultures. That's the first area, the belonging. <clears throat> the second is around um, engagement. And that's creating a dialogue within the firm and in the communities in which we operate, where we are trying to promote gender equality and have that become part of the mainstream dialogue and ensure within the profession more generally and, and in our own firm that it's a top priority and it's, it's part of the day-to-day -day conversation. And then the final point is around uh, excelling. And so that's creating an environment where in our firm, <clears throat> everybody can succeed. And so that we've got the right structures in place to help support people progress through the organisation. So that could be mentoring or sponsorship or, or various different uh, structures like that. So I think those three pillars, if we were able to consistently achieve that across the profession, then I think that would help to drive 
change. And there's within each of those three areas, a lot of different practical things that can be done from, from role models, as you've said, and demonstrating that there are a range of different ways to succeed within the, the legal profession. There's not just one uh, size fits all um, th through to tracking and monitoring progress and holding management to account for lack of progress, if, if that is unfortunately where, where we are. So I do think there's quite a lot that all leaders of organisations uh, can be doing to try and drive change across the whole profession. Going back again to what you have achieved, um, not just in your career, but you know this moment in history that we're marking around your um, you becoming the senior partner. What is this? What does this moment mean for you personally? Obviously, you mentioned your father celebrating fifty years. So hopefully, it's all one big celebration in the family in terms of you know landmarks for for you and the family. But what what did it mean for you? A very good question. And it's interesting, throughout the election, I was really just focused on the issues that were under debate within the, the firm. So the election process provided an opportunity for a very open and vibrant discussion about where the firm is today and where we want to take it as partners over the years ahead, which was, I have to say, really, really rewarding and provided an opportunity to meet and debate with partners across the whole world in a way that doesn't arise in our usual day-to-day -day, um, operations. And so that was the primary focus. I didn't really think about um, the, the wider import of the, the election if, if, I, if I was to be successful. Even on the night when I got the phone call to say that uh, I had won the election, I was focused more on the, the privilege of the, being a custodian or steward of the, the firm and the significant responsibility that comes with that. And then it was really only in the, the 24 or 48 hours after that that the, um, the effect of the appointment on women and men, but uh, women in particular in, within our own organisation and in the legal profession more, more generally, really became apparent with uh, a lot of interest, a lot of emails coming in from people across the world and across the profession, um, including many people that I didn't know, with people pointing to the fact that this was hopefully going to um, send a message within the profession and, and lead to others moving into leadership roles as well. So it's been, been an extraordinary couple of weeks um, and the level of support and encouragement and wonderful, wonderful messages from across the profession has been quite overwhelming, to be honest. Has your father had any, any message for you? <laughs> um, Dad always has good advice <laughs> for me. Um, the wonderful thing is I think he believed, has believed in me throughout my whole uh, life and so when I said I was considering putting myself forward for the election um, we talked through the pros and cons and then he had uh, absolute conviction right from the beginning that I would win which is exactly what you want from a parent <laughs> even if he was ultimately proven wrong to have somebody believe in you like that I think makes a big difference to how confident you feel in trying new things so I'm um, very fortunate. Now that you are a role model, um, who inspired you as you, you know, made your way for your career? And uh, who are your role models, your mentors? You know, mm. what happened to you to be able to position you in such a great place? I think I've been very lucky, actually. Um, and maybe part of it has been moving around the world and, and having the opportunity to work with so many different people. But um, given my parents have had a star showing through our discussion today, I probably have to start by saying my parents. I think their focus on um, fairness, justice, trying to always do the right thing right from being a child, I think probably shaped or has shaped the way I at least try to um, approach my life, both as a lawyer, as a, a wife, as a, as a parent. Um, so I'd have to point to them as role models from when I was young through to, through to now. Um, on the professional side, um, many men and women... <clears throat> I have played different roles over my career in helping me see, I think, different aspects of what it means to be a lawyer, what it means to be a leader, what it means to, to be looking after a team. So from some people, you learn the patience of taking the time to explain a task properly and to provide good feedback at the end of it, which is unbelievably important and really meaningful to developing your teams. Other people show you how to balance family commitments and work in a way that is, is very meaningful for them. Increasingly, I'm looking at those people who are very good at managing their um, well-being, both their mental and their physical well-being, and, and running that effectively alongside work. Because I think for me personally, 
and for the profession more generally, that's going to be one of the biggest challenges over the extended period of, uh, of COVID, I think, ensuring that we're looking after ourselves. We're demonstrating to our teams that we're looking after ourselves for, for all leaders, I think, is going to be really important. Let's look a little bit to the future because, um, you know, we've kind of looked at a bit to the past, the inspiration to what you've become for the present, but obviously you will leave a, a mark for, for future generations. So what are your hopes that... Um, you know, for equality, for diversity, for inclusion in the legal profession? And also, how do you hope to tackle these big themes and where will they sit in your leadership um, as you take the help? It's a top priority um, <clears throat> for me to, within our organisation, and then I think to the extent I can more broadly in the, the legal profession, be trying to drive through meaningful change. Um, and to help ensure that the topic of gender equality and, and diversity and inclusion more generally is at the top of the agenda in the profession. Um, so it is it's top of the agenda. We have a fantastic diversity and inclusion team who are going to support us in a range of different initiatives so that we can move from where we are today as an organisation, which is not where we would like to be, uh, to have better representation across the, the board within, within the firm. And I think if you then we look within our firm and um, within the industry more generally, I don't think there's a good reason for why we are where we are today. And so if we all acknowledge that there's no good reason to be where we are and we go back to those three areas that I talked about before, really focusing on creating an inclusive workplace, a place where people can excel and where there's a good dialogue around change, then hopefully that will ensure that all organisations recognise that the, the status quo can't be maintained and that we can then see some really meaningful change in the next five, ten years. Again, that's really great to hear, and it's great to hear that it's at the very top of your agenda. Um, mm. And uh, hopefully you can collaborate with clients, with the whole ecosystem, because change, you know, at a grander scale is great to, to be achieved. So it's fantastic. Mm. Specials can do it, but hopefully more will follow and actually we can achieve a really good place for, for everybody to excel, as you said. I think that kind of partnership is critical to driving through change. And I'm constantly saying to our clients and um, clients in particular, please do make this a topic of conversation, because if you are demanding change, then we will have to react to that. So to the clients who might be sitting at the dinner this evening and, and hearing this, please do um, be pushing for change across the legal profession, because I think your voices will be heard. Sure. And especially with the numbers of women coming in, and obviously we have more and more interest from non-white um, people are joining the profession. So we want to have, you know, a profession that represents everybody that needs access to justice. So it's really important to start opening opportunities for everybody who's interested in a career in law. I have one more, if you like, final question. Again, a reflection of my kind of knowledge from um, studying the history of women in law and, and your background around, you know, disputes and litigation and... Um, it's quite interesting because a lot of the kind of change in, in um, the early days of women in law came through barristers and women using their mm. voices and being advocates, being in a way campaigners, but not necessarily because they set out to be campaigners or pioneers. It's because they could use advocacy because in a way, you know, being a barrister, being on your feet, being a litigator um, seemed to help. Um, has it shaped you um, working in this space? Do you think um, it kind of, made you more courageous maybe it's a good question I've, I've never <laughs> never reflected on that before I think um, advocacy and, and public speaking is something that all of us including myself struggle with and so I guess the the more practice you have whether that's through your day job or or through a role that you might hold that the better you become at it and so maybe then that does give you the confidence to uh, to try for various different roles where advocacy is going to be required and, and that includes leadership roles so you might be right I just have never I've never thought of it in those terms but um, it's a I think that public speaking and, and having your voice heard is probably one of the areas that requires focus across diversity programs within within organizations because I do think that's an area that can make a difference to the success of um, women and, and other minority groups within organisations. So um, you might be right that that's an area that we should be focusing on to help drive through some more 
uh, change and get bring people through to leadership, but I, I haven't focused on whether it specifically shaped me. Well, I mean, it's just learning, you know, again, looking at qualities um, of women that have broken new ground. Um, it, it seems to be a powerful perseverance, which is always um, there. Um, they don't leave. They stay and, and they stay in the profession to have a, a place at the table, if you like, and have the opportunity. But certainly this kind of courage and using their voice came through. Um, and I was just wondering whether it's linked to the aerial practice to some degree. But you're right. I mean, one of the um, one of the things that we've um, identified was this use of voice, but also in a more um, a challenging environment, for example, public uh, speaking, but as a public lecture format, which is more difficult, more complicated, you know, putting ideas that are more universal across, you know, um, to a mixed audience. And uh, one of the things that we are starting this year, actually in December, is a, a series of public lectures um, where we will be inviting women to speak, at least at the beginning, and they have to talk on very big themes. So this year's theme is freedom. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm really excited about seeing how they shape their thoughts and to really display their brilliant minds, because to me, I think that is a great opportunity for us to show what women are capable of, but also from the, not just because they're women, but because they are great minds. And um, so we're very focused on putting that across. That sounds like a fantastic platform. I'll keep an eye out for it. <laughs> we'll make sure we'll invite you and yeah. uh, hopefully the hour is aligned, but otherwise we'll share a, a video um, of it. But um, anyway, so I think we are reaching our end for our chat and I hope we will continue our conversation and we'll uh, for sure follow your um, your path um, and uh, hopefully we'll, we'll get the opportunity to sit down together again, maybe even face to face in 2021. That would be lovely. I look forward to that. And thank you again for the invitation. It's been lovely to chat to you. Thank you so much.